uh, as simple as basic also as possible and at the same time uh, we will have some little bit of interaction towards the end so i might rush around a bit when i see that you know the audience already understands a lot and i don't need to get into too much so at the outset no disclosures this is not there i'm going to try and talk to you about the role of an ent surgeon today <clears throat> The only thing that I'm going to do different now is that I know that the audience levels is very up now in the sense the audience is much more mature, they understand a lot more. So I'm not going to talk as if I'm talking to a first MBBS uh, person. I'm going to try and presume that a lot of people know a lot about it. But in case there is something that needs to be brought out, then I'll leave it for the moderators to get it out at the end of the show. So greetings from Pune. I was always very proud to put up this slide as the Oxford of the East. Pune is the Oxford of the East. Unfortunately, I'm a little ashamed to say that Pune today is the highest number of COVID cases in the country. So we are still first. Whichever way you look at it, Pune is still on the top. But that's something which I pray will go away very soon. So this is a very underdiagnosed and undiagnosed kind of a situation. We all know that. We also know that the incidence is very high in the tune of about 19 to 20 percent out of which about four to five percent so one fourth of all sleep disorders are basically obstructive in nature so you can imagine that the numbers are very high if you uh, correlate it or uh, you know put it in numbers not percentages that's very high but they will not come to you so maybe now in my practice over so many years People do come to me with uh, for snoring or sleep apnea because of whatever background that has happened over the years. But you will very rarely find many people coming to you and saying that I've got sleep apnea and things like that. So you'll have to keep your index of suspicion very high. And these are this is one situation where leading questions need to be asked. If you are able to detect one particular thing in their history, then you've got to start asking leading questions. It's not like you're taking them in a different direction, but this uh, disorder needs leading questions. Now, what happens is when you start practicing in the field of sleep, you know, then people don't have the concept of sleep disorder. So they will all, you will have people talking to you about difficulty in falling asleep or I get up at night and then again, I can't fall asleep, etc., etc. So you have to realize that as an ENT surgeon, we are not here to treat insomnias, parasomnias, dysomnias, and all those other sleepwalking related issues. Because if you get into that, you are going to get extremely bored, you're going to get fed up, and you're not even going to be able to contribute to the treatment. So you have to realize what do you want to treat. So we don't treat this. We are supposed to be looking at these kind of symptoms from them. So we're going to look at them or snoring, obviously, because that is the biggest thing that we propagate for snoring and that's why I have this anti-snoring logo of mine since 15 years and you have to have people giving you history of apneic episodes, choking, gasping at night and early morning headaches but the most characteristic is the not feeling fresh in the morning and most of them will probably approach you with related to you know this kind of a headache which they think is sinus related and they'll say we keep having this is the sinusitis this that and that's when you have to start digging into not feeling fresh, the excessive daytime somnolence, and then the choking and the gasping episodes from seen by the, the bed partner, not the patient themselves. So these are what you've got to be looking at. And then also, when they come to you with snoring, there is another, there's a complete uh, definition of snoring. So you can go and read about it. There are grades of snoring, one, two, three, four, starting from, you know, uh, minimal snoring, snoring heard from, uh, to four going to snoring heard in the other room with a closed door. Grade three is loud snoring, disturbing sleep of the partner, etc., etc. So we're not looking at the decibels of snoring, but you will have snorers who are occasional. Obviously, all of us post uh, alcohol, many people do snore. There are habitual snorers and heroic snorers, like I said, are the ones which are from. They are heard outside the room in a different room altogether. So. The question that has to come to your mind, again, this is why I'm putting it like this because I'm trying to get you the rational and the kind of approach that you have to these patients who come to you. So we are not going to be looking at all of these, but we are definitely going to be looking at the habitual heroic ones or the ones that say to you that the snoring is associated with a daytime somnolence. But the biggest ones that we got to be looking at is the ones whose quality of life 
totally gets disrupted because of a sleep disorder like this. Not the quality of life of the bed partner, but the patient themselves. So they will have EDS, they will have early morning headaches, they will have lethargy, they will have low productivity, they will have intermarital personal relationship issues because of the tiredness and because of the, you know, um, neurocognitive issues that crop in. So those are ones that we really need to look into. You don't need to look into an occasional person or a person who snows after alcohol. So these are things on history which you really need to pick up from all of them. And obviously, once you've picked up a history of snoring, we all know that it's related to sleep apnea, but there's also something which is like simple snoring without sleep apnea. Now, needless to say that simple snoring will have a different treatment and snoring with sleep apnea is a totally different ball game. And that's the one that is OSA, which we are like really uh, hell bent on dealing with. And that's the one that we play a major role in doing so. So again, this is the five minutes that you have or 10 minutes that you have in your OPD where you're looking at the patient, you're taking the history and your mind has got to start thinking like this. Is it simple snoring? Is it snoring with sleep apnea? Is it central apnea or is it obstructive apnea? Because based on this is the decision that I will take about what I'm actually going to do for this person. Because if it's simple, if it's central apnea, then it's not my ball game. Then I would rather involve a neurologist or the other team members in uh, the field of sleep apnea to look into it. But if it is OSA, it is strictly my domain. So once we have to figure that out about central apnea or OSA, then we have to also figure out about how severe is the OSA because that determines the urgency and that will also determine a lot of things that we are going to do for this patient and trying to treat this patient. So once we've understood that it's snoring or snoring with sleep apnea, so simple snoring or snoring means that there is an obstruction somewhere which is the anatomical part is what we've got to figure out. And the physiological part is to how bad is that obstruction affecting the actual, uh, you know, life of that patient. So you need to understand the physiology and you need to understand the anatomy. In the anatomy, which is what we need as ENT surgeons, this is how your mind should start thinking. While you're examining the patient, this is exactly how your mind should be thinking. Where is the obstruction? Can I on a clinical basis try and figure it out? Can I in the OPD with a flexible scope try and figure this out? Because at least these many questions I will be able to answer. Because if I can answer these questions to myself while I'm examining the patient, then at least I will have some answers at the end of the consultation to give that patient. So where is the obstruction? Is that obstruction skeletal, soft tissue or is it both? Is it at one level at the nose or palate or you know base tongue or below or is it multi-level involvement? So based on that, I will have some idea whether you know this is likely to be surgical or maybe I can get away with this in a non-surgical manner. Let's say you don't find anything anywhere except in the nose and which is more allergic in nature. Then I'm looking at it in a very non-surgical conservative manner. Or maybe you find something like a very simple elongated uvula cause of the snoring causing the snoring, then you can get away with simple office procedures and you may not need anything very complex. So within those first 10 minutes, you have to figure out all these things based on history about the snoring. Is it simple snoring? Sleep apnea, snoring with sleep apnea. Then I need to figure out where is the level of obstruction because I've got to see that. The physiological part, you cannot do it immediately in your OPD. But that severity and central apnea finding out becomes extremely important. So as you go across, this is how you're going to think. In the physical evaluation, this is where we as ENT surgeons have always failed. We failed because we neglected this a lot, you know. So this, this came across to me when I was, you know, doing FES workshops. I was faculty at FES workshops when we started off way back. I'm talking about even 15 years back before I got into OSA. And over a period of time in FES, what happened was that we stopped relying on uh, uh, we stopped relying on the radiologists to go ahead and uh, report to us their uh, you know CT scans. We started reading our own CT scans. I'm sorry, I just saw a question popped up by somebody: Is pediatric dice really necessary? So just hold your horses. I'm coming to everything. I will address most of the issues that I possibly can. 
and if not then at the end of it what i will do is i'll skip through a lot of things faster so that we can have a good interaction at the end just hold your horses on those questions for now so this is the levels of the sleep evaluation that we have you have level 1 level 2 level 3 level 4 i'll just quickly go through all of them this is how a level 1 is basically so all of you all can see this and you will understand that it's a very complex situation where you have eegs emgs eogs the uh, tibialis anterior uh, uh, triggers the abdominal thoracic movements the nasal cannulas the pulse oximetries and everything and if you look at this particular video this is a very old video of mine when i just started off of course better machines now and better private rooms in the hospitals now but you can see so many wires it's practically impossible for a person to sleep with this it's very difficult so that's where the problem with the level 1 comes there is an issue with availability there is an issue with expense there is an issue with the acceptance by the patient and most important are you in a position to interpret that eeg eog and emg so even if i insist on a level 1 study after i get that whole big sheet of invest uh, reporting in front of me am i really able to understand it because it's jargon it's latin and american to me so it doesn't make sense unless you actually learn to read it so for all practical purposes although that is the gold standard it has issues level 2 is the same thing without an attendant level 1 is obviously in house with an attendant doing a video recording so imagine somebody sitting on your head and recording you all through the night it's not easy to sit and sleep like that so a level 3 is the basic one uh, the four channel uh, please all the seniors please pardon me for talking about all this because i feel that maybe if it's there for the pgs and the juniors for them whom this was meant this may sound very basic to you and very boring and very repetitive to you but my apologies but i'm going through it as fast as i can so that i don't bore the rest of you so a level 3 is just four things chest movements abdominal movements pulse ox and nasal air flow and to me as an ent surgeon that should be more than enough because it gives me a lot of in, you know information about uh, whether it's obstructive or whether there's center the only problem with the level 3 is that you you don't have the same sleep time and total time in bed so when the time in bed increases it is not exactly the sleep time it is simple logic for you to understand that when you have to derive the ahi ahi is the apnea hypoapnea index which means apneas plus hypoapneas divided by the number of hours of sleep and when the number of hours of sleep are less but it is being reported as more because the total time in bed is what the level 3 machine tells us so automatically the denominator becomes bigger and therefore the ahi reported becomes lesser so the thing you have to understand in level 3 is that it is under diagnosing the ahi so whatever ahi you get expect at least 15 20% more than that because that's one of the fallacies of a level 3 study and uh, there are issues with probe dislodging Uh, reliability issues and things like that but we can bypass that now the interpretation is very simple if you all can see this chart clearly sri arsha can you see this chart clearly yes sir seen yeah so here if you see there is an effort here there's a flow here there's a spo2 over here right so whenever there is effort but no flow with a fall in saturation means the patient is trying to breathe but there is no oxygen and the oxygen is falling that means it's obviously obstructive he is taking the effort to breathe the oxygen is not going in and thereby he is having obstructive sleep apnea the same chart may when you have when there is no effort no flow and oxygen falling then it obviously is simple logic that this is central apnea because the brain respiratory centers have not given the signal and thereby we are seeing an event which is a central apnea so you need to be able to understand this basics at least to interpret in case the lab people give you a wrong report or the lab people give you a report which is not correlating with your uh, so called uh, clinical findings now this is level 4 not to be accepted not accepted anywhere it's just a simple pulse oximetry so which of these finally do you use always level 1 is a gold standard if it is available we are also pushing for it because at present that is the gold standard but if you don't have that and don't have access to it at least a level 3 do not accept a level 4 level 3 is by and large what is being used in india all across as 
not only screening but at least in terms of ENT surgeons being able to find out what is the level, I mean, how much is the obstruction there. Because in level 1 and level 3, the parameters that we are looking for as an ENT surgeon are all the same. So you have the same respiratory anal analyzer in both, the oximeter is the same, the abdominal thoracic belts are the same, position sensors are the same and thereby AHI reported is by and large the same except for the fact that in level 3 it is obviously a little underdiagnosed because the time for sleeping is a lot more. So again I come back to this, we finished the physiological part, this is what we are going to be looking at and no ANT surgeon in today's date has any problem in trying to figure this out because we have access to a lot of things to try and find out where is the anatomical obstruction. So you have clinical evaluations, you have scopic evaluations and you have radiology to try and find out where is the obstruction. Clinically, every one of y'all can see this, I don't need to talk about this, you have the Friedman staging which you can read up is basically related to tongue size, tonsil size. You have stage 1, 2, 3 and 4 based also on the BMI. But what is the clinical significance of this? So what you see in stage 1, 2, 3, 4 is as the tongue size increases, the stage goes on increasing. As tonsil size increases, stage goes on increasing. Basically that's what it's all about. But the clinical significance that you have to understand is exactly this. So if you have a stage 1 where you have big tonsils but small tongue, right? Then obviously you are going to have a better surgical outcome if you do anything to the palate. And I am underlining this statement, I am talking about do anything surgical to the palate, not tongue base or not anything related to the rest of the places. So uh, the staging makes it easier because stage 1 outcome is much better for palatal surgery, stage 3 outcome is poorer for palatal surgery and that's been proved by Friedman himself many a times. So you, you tend to have a lot of people sitting around, you know, this used to happen to me a lot often when people would say to me, when we are in the surgeon's lounge and two, three of us colleagues are sitting and talking and they say, yesterday I saw classical OSA, you know, classical OSA he was, you know, his history was like this and his findings were like this, 100% uh, OSA. So I got to thinking and I started looking up and that's when you realize that if OSA was so easy to be diagnosed just on the basis of clinical findings and history, then we would not have all these sleep studies and so many investigations that we still further need. So if you look up literature, you will find a lot of literature giving you a very clear cut indication that history and physical examination can diagnose it only in 50% of cases you'll miss a lot of cases if you don't go further with further investigations. So the scopic evaluations, we have scopies that can be done in many ways. Awake, lying down, flexible scopy is something that I do immediately in my OPD because I have access to a scope because I am specializing in practicing this. So I would recommend everybody to have that. If not, you should have access to a flexible scopy that you can do. You have dice and you have sleep nasal endoscopy while doing the endoscopy. In the awake lying down position, you can also ask them to do a Muller's maneuver or an end expiratory pressure recording. So, an expiratory pressure recording, uh, expiratory pressure visualization gives you a better visualization of the tongue base at times. But this is the best thing to do. A simple, flexible uh, evaluation becomes very easy. But you have to note not only just the antero posterior uh, falls or the uh, uh, what do you say narrowing, you have to also look at the mediolateral collapses as you see in these particular flexible scopies. So this is an awake endoscopy. The endoscopy sleep is not happening in India at all. Nobody is doing, the only place that I have seen in uh, sleep endoscopy is being done is where I trained at Mannheim in Germany under Professor Karl Hormann. They have a fantastic lab whereby they have a sleep study attached and they put in a very small pediatric fiber optic endoscope and they leave the recording through the night and there's a huge data. So through the night they have been actually recording the sleep and seeing the consistent findings. So it's an amazing lab but it's not happening in our country as yet and even I came back to India after training and I tried it but somehow Logistically, it was not possible to create a lab for uh, for uh, me also in a tertiary care center. There are too many logistics involved. I will not get into all of these uh, vigilance testings. Radiology, 
before the advent of dice and mri was only reliant on cephalometry and you had these huge angles and the distances and the you know curves and everything to measure but the biggest problem with this cephalometry was the fact that you know it is a static uh, evaluation it's in the awake position it's in the standing position so we are dealing with a dynamic obstruction during sleep and this cannot justify it at all so it has very limited applications i won't get into it we'll discuss this when it comes dynamic mri is something which i have propagated like crazy all across the country the you know north south east west of the country i have traveled to uh, give talks on dynamic mri i have always thought that this has been treated as an underdog this has a lot of scope mainly because it's not at all different i'll just rush through this i won't get into too much right now what happens is this is what you can see you can see in the sagittal section you'll be able to see at what levels is the uh, obstruction very clearly and in the axial section at different levels so you can have an axial section at the level of the palate you can have it at the lower border of the soft palate you can have it at the upper level of the epiglottis you can have it at the lower level of the epiglottis and all these axial sections can be taken in this vertical plane and the diameter can be measured ap and lateral in all these situations so that you have objective findings for you at the end when later on you want to reassess and you want to recheck this entire thing post any kind of treatment that you've done so these are the various levels where you can do it that i've shown you there are various other ways forget the indication like i said uh, the indication are basically to locate a definitive site of obstruction and i would say post operative unimproved patient this is very important but this is something which i put up about 8 or 9 years back today i'm hoping that we never have to use the word as post op unimproved patient because if we have much stringent measures to diagnose a patient before and and we do a good planning and a good counseling there is very less chance of having a post operative unimproved patient and yes medically unfit for dice because dice is a full fledged almost as close to a surgery as possible so anything where the patient is not really fit and uh, don't want to take him into the ot the dynamic mri really helps uh, i won't get into apneograph and this this is how now objectively you can compare you can see that there is a lesion of rf palate and you can see that there is a lesion of rf tongue base and you can see the opening of the airway here and here as compared to pre and post this is how objectively you are able to compare uh, the results pre and post op and you are able to evaluate failures because you get lot of this at least earlier i used to get where this patient has been operated here for a palate and they missed out the tongue base over here which is so huge and that's why this patient was called as a post operative failure now had i to be evaluating this patient i would have seen the tongue base before and i would say to the patient that we will do it in stages so after the palate surgery the patient will not feel that the surgery has failed we'll go in for a second stage and then go ahead and clear the second thing then is dice very important is the concept there's a huge big total lecture i can take on dice separately so i will not get into details just the very important point you need to have a very important consent because it is as good as going in for surgery and when you're going in for surgery you need to have a consent for tracheostomy you need to have a consent for intubation if that patient collapses and you need to do this in an ot setup with the same anesthetist whom you work with regularly please don't try to do a dice with just any tom dick and harry that is uh, you know by, with all due respect to all the anesthetists what i meant to say was any anesthetist ap appointed to your ot who has not worked with you before on a dice or on osa don't use him you or you train him with your particular anesthetist and then come back and do a dice with him because i have seen airway collapses with difficulty in intubation in my first one or two patients only of dice that we did and that put my radars really high and then we've been extremely careful with the dice that i do this monitoring is something else that we have to do so consent you have to take this is how you will be able to see this is an apneic spell in a dice you have to take the patient and the relatives in confidence and you have to make sure that you do the dice not on the day of surgery but it has to be done one or two days before surgery so that you are able to then 
give the patient the entire perspective of what you saw in dice what are you planning now to do in dice and whether the patient is willing to accept the treatment protocols laid down by you so this is when the snoring starts and then you start doing the dice and you see that there is no obstruction below but the uh, total initial collapse of the epiglottis was there so you do it in an OT setup, you have intubation, tracheostomy, trained anesthetist, dismonitoring, like I said, not the same per, not the same person at all times. And the cost of this monitor is a little high, I won't get into discussions right now. But what has changed about DICE a lot is the interpretation. Earlier we used to have just the area of collapse, then the degree of collapse. Now we've got the type of collapse as in AP lateral as well as concentric. And now you are able to put <clears throat> the enhanced dice because we are now taking it to the level of uh, the TNM classification in cancer. So you have something like uh, V1, AP, O2, L, T0, E0. So this is something if I say this to Sri Harsha, he knows very clearly I am talking about a velopharyngeal collapse which is partial and it is in the direction of AP only. And at the oropharyngeal I have a complete collapse in the lateral direction. The tongue base is no collapse, epiglottis is no collapse. So automatically I know what I'm dealing with. And when I give a picture like this, you're able to then get a clear mind, a picture in your mind that, okay, if it's a V2C, I'm talking about a velum complete circumferential collapse. And therefore I will have to do something to stabilize the lateral wall. I will have to do something to open up the anteroposterior diameter of this particular patient. And that's how I'm going to have to do it with the oropharynx also, tongue base also, as well as the epiglottis. Now, this uh, further classification of dice has made life a lot easier because just like two oncosurgeons discussing, now we are able to discuss and, you know, decide about what exactly procedure we want to follow if two colleagues need to communicate. Excuse me. Very sorry about that. So the limitations of dice that we used to have and uh, which has been bothering a lot of us is the fact that, you know, the chess physicians always kept telling us that, okay, you don't know what is the level of the depth of the study that you're doing. And that's why the interpretation cost and everything used to come in. So this is what made me start doing what is called as the advanced dice. So now if you see in this advanced dice, I am doing a dice. This is the endoscopic picture. This is the PSG that is going on and the patient is hooked on to a complete PSG. I hope this picture is very clear, sir. Yes, sir. Right. So here you can see that the patient has been hooked up to a complete PSG in the OT itself. And while I'm doing the dice, I'm watching the PSG so that I know at what level exactly I'm finding the obstruction because as you go deeper in sleep, the obstruction becomes worse. This is something that we all know. And this is what I started doing when the chess people started criticizing me and telling me that, oh, you're doing dice, you do it only for 15 minutes, you have no idea of what stage of sleep and all. But then over a period of time, what I realized was that, you know, this was not giving me any major information that I needed. And I was probably doing all this huge exercise only because the... Um, Chess people were questioning me and I was looking into them and trying to figure out that uh, I have to give them an answer that why is it, uh, why don't I know what level of sleep it is. So I really don't think advanced dice is of that much uh, requirement right now. Again, I won't get into a lot of things about dice, but dice versus awake, flexible, scopy, my thought process in today. And this is a statement that I've been very categorically making nowadays and I would like to bring it to your attention to all of y'all that we started doing DICE because we presumed and it was proven evidence-based with a lot of literature that doing a flexible awake lying down scopy, when you converted that to a DICE, the patient's obstruction worsened and you probably had obstruction which you had not seen with a uh, flexible awake scopy. That was the uh, basic argument. And that's how I also started doing dice. But over a period of years, in the past three years at least, what I have noticed is that let's say I'm doing a lying down flexible awake scopy in my clinic, right? Now I am, at least you are able to judge whether there's an AP collapse or a mediolateral collapse, 
right? Now, I agree that if I'm seeing a medial lateral collapse, which may be say 20% or 25% collapsing, when I do it in a dice, it will suddenly be like 70% of the airway collapse. Agree. I totally agree, right? So my question and my thought process became that if I am seeing in an awake situation, if I am seeing a mediolateral collapse and if I am seeing an anteroposterior collapse, am I not going to do any procedure to address that? So if I have already decided that there is a mediolateral collapse and I am going to do a procedure to address that mediolateral collapse, then how does it matter whether that collapse is 20%, 40%, 60% or 70%? So am I ever going to say that, okay, if the collapse is only 20%, I will not do the procedure. If it is more than 70%, then I will do the procedure. It is not like that. So once you see a mediolateral collapse and an anteroposterior collapse, you will make efforts to address that collapse. So then where is really the role of dice that comes in? So this is a statement which I have started making in the past few years because I have realized one thing that we tend to, you know, really start getting uh, you know, after one new thing when it comes. So obviously you must because you must do it. You must see the benefits of it. Dice is very good. It gives us a lot of information. Yes, no doubt. Evidence based proven practically on ground zero does it really change my methodology or does it change my planning of surgery? So if I am going to do a lateral wall procedure, will doing a dice make me change that procedure into anything else? That is my question and that is the reason why I am making this statement. Please take this as a very important take home message. And this is why I said that, you know, there are a lot of randomized trials that have been done pros and cons for DICE and quite a few of them have shown that DICE does not actually improve surgical results so far. So that is one of the reasons why I looked into these kind of control trials and figured that out. So there are no clear cut answers. This is what I was saying to you in this past two minutes that does any change in decision based on DICE increase my surgical success? No, it doesn't. Are there any certain prognostic signs that I may see on a dice that will guide me for decision making, which will help me improve my success or failure? Not really. Since there are no clear cut yes answers to this, I don't think it's that important to push for a dice in today's day. Again, this is with the with a pinch of salt. I'm saying this because I do a lot. I used to do a lot of dice past four or five months. So. I guess none of it. at least I have not been doing much of it at all. So these are articles which will show you that yes, dice did change some planned protocols for tongue base and epiglottis, but not for the palate. Okay, so for palate it does not help, but in the other cases sometimes yes it does help. Now let's not get into all this. So there is a consensus now that you do a dice, and if you are not able to do a dice, you just do a flexible awake supine position scopy. So this will give you the intrinsic view. Combine it with an MRI from the outside that will give you an extrinsic view of the airway. So there you have a complete reconstructed airway intrinsically as well as from the outside. So what is the protocol I follow? Strictly the history taking like I told you. Decide in your mind whether you are going to recommend a sleep study to this patient or not. Grade it clinically. Do an FNLP if you have it in the OPD. Before going out, get an Edward uh, sleepiness scale form filled, not only for documentation, but also for the sake of MLC purposes. Nowadays, that has become very important. And you schedule a sleep study for this patient always. And with the sleep study, you ask the patient to do a CPAP trial also. Now, this has two basic advantages. One is you're going as per science because in today's date, uh, CPAP is considered the gold standard. And secondly, if the patient is not tolerating the CPAP, he will be more than willing to take your treatment ahead, whatever treatment you have actually been advising him. Uh, thank you, Farida ma'am for that comment. I happen to see that in the chat box. So that's just the way I think ma'am that, you know, you have to be very practical about what you do in life. There is something that we have to be very evidence based, no doubt, but at the same time manage to be very practical in what you're doing and not just ape. Uh, everything that is put out there. So anyway, coming back to the topic, uh, you review the sleep study in detail yourself, correlated with your clinical findings. 
and then you go ahead and identify what is exactly the level of obstruction and then go ahead for the initial preliminary counseling stage and in this counseling session again your thought process has to be very right it's not about the kind of risk that you are willing to take it's about the kind of risk that the patient is willing to take so you need to explain to the patient everything about the procedure and its potential risks and you yourself have to first evaluate the risk to benefit ratio for that patient so if the risk to benefit ratio is not good let's say you are dealing with a 110 kg patient who's got comorbidities of uh, you know hypertension diabetes cardiac risk and you have a simple procedure which you know that okay in the pallet i can do it it will hardly take me 20 minutes but will that patient really benefit from just that single palliative procedure that you're going to do because of his weight and his other comorbidities will you be putting him through high risk just for something which will give him like say a 20 30% result so you need to weigh this out very importantly you need to introspect on yourself what is your training and expertise what kind of post op backup you have when you're dealing with these patients you need to understand the uh, entire physiology and pathophysiology of this and most important again you need evidence based data also about the various surgeries because your patients nowadays ask you a whole lot of questions just like in a stapes i'm sure all of you all have been asked dr saab how many stapes have you done dr saab what are your results of stapes dr saab is stapes really a good surgery or not so people are coming to you with data they are coming to you with evidence based things and if you offer them let's say a uh, expansion sphincteroplasty they will question you and say why not a barbed why not a reconstruction why just a lateral pharyngoplasty so you need to be very sure about what you are doing and you have to have your data in hand now again there's a few practical ground points that i've seen because whenever i traveled earlier not any more travel seems to be a far off thing now it will all be virtual lectures in the near future now uh people would always talk to me and um, say that you know uh it's a big problem no patient is willing to pay 5 6000 for sleep studies how can we tell a patient to do this much just for snoring and we are a third world country with limited resources and i personally believe that is a lot of nonsense because as you can see i saw this in a in a clinic at a calcutta doctors uh, uh, you know consulting when i had gone and he had put this up a patient pays and spends in lakhs on gold and holidays but when it comes to doctors fees he reacts as if you're robbing him this attitude has to change even the attitude for early diagnosis has to change this is where i think we are all going very wrong i mean even if you look at today's date of covid majority of the problem is because people are scared to do that early diagnosis they don't want to they are they are fighting against a uh, thing where they say oh it could be viral it's okay first we'll wait for 3 days we'll wait for 5 days then we'll do the test early diagnosis always leads to early interpret in a uh, interference early treatment and better results that should be the dictum that we have to promote in all our patients i see that happening today also very very clearly patients are reporting late for covid because they have tested on the 5th 6th day when people say that don't test if you have no symptoms fine but if you have symptoms test on day 1 that's the only way that you're going to do it i did that for my own daughter on day 1 of fever i tested anyway coming back to the point so you need to get them to become more proactive in their evaluation because if you do the sleep study and diagnose you will prevent them for lot from their cardiovascular uh, and neurocognitive issues at a later date so if you talk to them you talk to them science explain to them how damage can happen if they do not test themselves and for those patients who do not understand body uh, physiology and they talk only on money then you've got to give them this consideration that okay you may need to spend 6 to 10000 for snoring evaluation it's not an overkill because if you consider that you land up getting hypertension you're going to use 1000 rupees worth of medication per month lifelong so that's in the first year only spending more than 12000 or if you need an angiography it's 10000 angioplasty 1 or 2 lakhs bypass 1 lakh etc etc so those who understand your language of physiology explain to them that prevention is better 
those who understand the language of economy you need to put it across to them in the economic manner but that's the way that you have to try and explain to your patient do not push do not try to convince them only try to educate them with the arguments the way they want to uh, arguments in the language that they understand now the other thing that is a very big skepticism in all the things that i have been doing for so many years in in fact just last week there was a, a meeting that i conducted again the, the audience was slightly different but there was so much skepticism from the ent surgeons fraternity about the entire treatment protocol and how effective it is and that is why i have to say this point that why are we so skeptical about treatment what are we defining as cure now in this particular presentation i am not added those points about what is cure for osa uh there are new criteria that are coming out they are not the criteria that have been developed by share at all where they said that reduction in ahi less than 20 or reduction in ahi up to 50% of pre operative ahi now the problem with that was if the ahi was around 85 and it reduced to say 50 or 25 then it was still not considered positive because it was below or below 20 sorry it was considered positive because it is less than 50% but let's say from 85 to 55 they said it was not a success so that is why our success treatment criteria now changes we have to talk about downgrading the disease improving the quality of life of the patient as a part of cure not complete cure because we never cure diabetes we never cure hypertension in fact even a neurosurgeon never cures a pituitary tumor he's always left something behind over there but that's not called uh, you know not success to treatment right so you have to take the criteria of treatment very different i'll discuss that at a much different stage and why we ents need to come into the picture is because i've been discussing this a lot of places you have an initial failure of cpap let's say cpap is the gold standard in today's date and that's why i have said that our criteria are changing now cpap will no longer be considered over a period of time as the gold standard because we are coming up with very good data for surgeries and we will be able to give out better data for surgery because if you look at the say, failure of surgical treatment we have good uh, results in the initial say 2 3 months and our long term surgical failures come to the range of about 50% If you look at the CPAP, their acceptance is also at the same level, and their long-term compliance is also at 50%. And these are not my figures; these are figures that are published by the chest physicians at the major chest forums that they are talking on. Also, so if after three years my surgical result is only 50%, and if after three years even the use of CPAP is only 50%, then what is the harm in me doing simple? non risky surgeries palatal surgeries which we as ent surgeons are so good at and we know that palatal surgeries mein kya hoga i mean what is there is really not much you know difficulty in a palatal surgery or danger in a palatal surgery from the point of view of surgery per se again wrongly selected patient very difficult situation so i have a very completely different lecture on decision making in palatal surgeries alone for osa hopefully sometime we will do that for this audience also but it's there for people to look into so if you select a proper case for surgery and even if you are able to give a surgical result which will last 3 years 4 years and remain up to 50% you are still able to do something better than a chest physician or any other physician who's only going to prescribe cpap so he'll do a battery of tests do all that and his only answer is cpap we as an ent surgeon will do a battery of tests we'll have the option of offering both the cpap as well as surgery and we will weigh the pros and cons about what we need to do for that person so cpap earlier it was thought to be the only answer now it is not neither is surgery the final cure you need to tailor make this based on what you find right treatment options are plenty i'll just breeze through them right now there is no medical treatment you have uh mandibular appliances cpaps lifestyle issues but what was lacking by the ent surgeon was the fact that we were not understanding and not accepting the multifactorial etiology of this problem we were not looking at the problem as a multi level approach we were just the so called egoistic knife happy surgeons who would look at something there 
we see a pallet which is causing an obstruction and cut 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 you go and cut it off without you know even thinking about the intricacies of where else is the obstruction is the patient really going to benefit from this alone do we need to do something more further etc etc so don't be knife happy that's where we were lacking and the choice of procedure eventually has to be mostly dependent on a lot of things evaluation yes based on your psg level of evaluation based on your dice and mri and the collapse but most important and again here i'm making a very very important point most important choice of my procedure has always been the patient profile you will you know and i say this from ground reality that you will never really have a farmer i have not had poor people or the daily wage worker coming up to me and saying i'm snoring and i'm having so much problems and because of this my you know i'm abusing my wife or i'm drinking alcohol and all that they are they are too busy in uh, you know trying to look into their uh, sorry i saw that one more comment there by dr patil and i'll come back to that please just hold on uh they are too busy in their day to day life and they are not the kind who are going to sit around and look into this so the kind of patient that approaches me for a treatment is generally the middle class upper middle class it tech kind of a person or a person who is uh, the upper class or the elite businessman now these kind of people have multiple options available to them a lot of them a lot of the industrialists that you tend to treat will have so many questions asking you doc i'll go to the uk i'll buy a machine from there doc my brother is coming down from us i'll pick it up doc i can go to john hopkins and check it out so you know that's the basic kind of clientele that you will always try to you tend to get and for them you need to first understand make them understand educate them motivate them and then go ahead because if they are not motivated then these are the ones that are going to give you the bad name without dropping names i can tell you a lot of big guns whom you land up treating will invariably for fear of surgery land up just buying 5 6 7 machines and leave them and probably never use them again so these are the kind of patients that you need to spend a lot of time in education you cannot expect that they will get on to your table even for a simple dice they will think 10 times they are not the kind who will get into you yes after some time when they understand everything and they have the faith in you these are the kinds that you have to treat and then your own introspection about the fact that you need to know what is your level of expertise and training if you're not really trained in well, you know say massive tongue based surgeries or if you're not trained in handling complications of tongue based surgeries do not get into it you have to have a very thorough knowledge of anatomy this goes without saying for every ent surgeon for every surgeon per se but again i come back to my point of the risk versus benefit ratio of the uh, surgery to that patient and all patients are looking for invasive to switch to non invasive therapy so if i can give you a broad surgical candidacy it would be type 1 meaning upper level obstructions primary snorers are people that you will have on your golden platter because these are the ones which are presumably without sleep apnea so fat 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 you remove the the obstruction and you are done and free with that the failure of cpap compliance obviously because these are the ones you only you can treat and nobody else can treat ahi is no longer this is an older presentation of mine but ahi no longer has any role to play in an ent surgeon deciding about the surgery so i if the patient has an ahi of even 120 130 i don't care as long as i can see an obstruction which i can tackle then i don't care about the level of uh, the uh, number on the ahi bmi yes very high bmi i would not want to do anything about and obviously the moderate ones are better so this is by and large a surgical candidacy that you can think of but keep in mind that as an ent surgeon if you see this complex slide it all eventually is talking about the causes of obstructive sleep apnea here and we as an ent surgeon are responsible for only this range over here none of this entire rest of the things on the slide that you see are in our domain so although we think we can do so much we will always have limitations because we are tackling only the obstruction part and not the rest of the complexities of the osa 
So in a general consensus, uh, it is a teamwork. ENTs play a major role. ENTs need to take some effort in learning and interpreting your own sleep studies, understanding the dynamics of OSA, understanding how treatment protocols have changed. Again, I'm repeating that uh, the entire criteria for treatment is changed. It will come in following lectures. So my humble appeal to all of you all is not to use your, you know, adrenaline rush that you get when pushing the patient into the OT. Use your mind. Start doing a lot of dynamic MRIs versus DICE, what I just told you, and which I hope a lot of you people will accept what I have said on that. And it makes a lot of sense to me and to a lot of my colleagues. So a dynamic MRI is a better way, is a more less invasive way to identify that. And based on this, if we can, and I have been requesting all HODs of over you know, various colleges across India that you have students, get some student to get a thesis, help collect this Indian data so that, you know, as a group or as a, somebody who can take the lead, I can try and standardize this like we are now all doing guidelines everywhere. So if you have a candidate who will take up a, a thesis where flexible awake scopy can be correlated with the obstruction seen on a dynamic MRI, then this can get us a lot of data where we can do this and save a lot of things from, I mean, a lot of patients from undergoing dice as needed. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, education is not just the learning of facts. It's very easy to learn the facts. It's very easy to learn surgeries. Surgeries are very simple, but it is important to train your mind to think in the right direction. It's extremely important to think in the right direction. Apply your mind and select the cases. One sec, Shalini is requesting to unnote the shared content. What is that, Shalini? You wanted me to share something? Okay, never mind. I think that was yeah. but Okay, so, and this is a video which uh, I'm sure all of you all know Dr. Robert Wasser from Béziers, France. He has been very gracious to give me this video in 1996 when I had invited him into Pune for the first time in India. And I used this video of his with his permission since 1996. It's a very good video. I'll just play it for you. It will give you an idea of the fact that you as an OSA surgeon want to do the right thing. You think you've diagnosed correctly, but you've probably not understood everything and then all the things that you want to do are not helpful. Sri Arsha, tell me if you cannot hear this video or see this, okay? Sorry. Say again. Please. Do you hear that, Sri Arsha? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to continue playing it. It's courtesy Dr. Robert Mercer, 1996. Excuse me, madam. This might do the trick. Oh. At Caltex, our staff will do whatever they can. Thank you so much. You're welcome. To help make your life a little easier. <laughs> You diagnosed wrong, that's yep. where you went wrong. And these are two slides or pictures of mine which our dear friend Dr. Prakash Munka is very, very pleased with. He always loves to see the slides, so I put this up. The more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know about this disorder. And the less you know, the more you think you know. This is also applicable in the present COVID situation to all of us. We think we know a lot. But please follow the guidelines. Early diagnosis becomes very important. And then we can take. I am stuck to my time, uh, Shri Archa. I didn't want to exceed that because I would rather we have a lot of interaction. And since this particular talk was only with regards to rational and a proper approach, I have not gotten into any of the surgical techniques. But we have those talks of mine which you have already seen where we can discuss every surgery step by step. We can discuss nose, we can discuss nasopharynx, we can discuss the various palatal surgeries and then we can discuss the decision making of palatal surgery, then tongue base, then epiglottis and below further down. 
So go ahead now. Yeah, I'm right. going to stop sharing screen. Where do I stop sharing screen from? Ah, here, here. I got that. Right. So all over to you, Sri Arsha. Bang. And thank Excellent you for all those who have probably skipped their dinner or maybe finished their dinner and sitting here with us on a Sunday evening. Yes. So go we ahead. Have we had a few questions, sir. And that's okay, that. once again, before I start, Riyarsha, I just want to address two or three very important ones that I read. Let me just address Dr. Prakash Munka and Dr. Venus Patel first, then we'll take that. Dr. Munka says, once you put the patient on CPAP and he gets benefit, patient may never come back for surgery as most of the patients want to avoid surgery. Sir, very good. If he doesn't come back to you, that's not the patient that you want to operate anyway. So if a patient doesn't come back to you, koi gum nahi hai, sir. Any patient who doesn't come back to you for surgery, feel that you have been saved from such a patient. Uh, Dr. Venus Patel, when some patients may require CPAP even after surgery, how to convince patients preoperatively about this? Why would patient consider surgery at the end he may need CPAP? So that's exactly the point, uh, Dr. Venus, that why you need to do the sleep studies beforehand. Because if you've got a central apnea over there, then the final effect of surgery, he is going to need a CPAP for his central apnea. So this is a situation where you have a gross DNS in an allergic rhinitis patient. So you've got to treat the allergic rhinitis also. You've got to treat the septoplasty also. So you've got to tell the patient you've got a two-in-one problem. So similarly, if he's got a CPAP, uh, sorry, central apnea, the obstruction is not going to go away with the CPAP you are going to have to do something about the obstruction. And again, it is about downgrading the entire disease. So if the patient's disease gets downgraded, that itself is improvement of surgery in itself. So let me put it to you in another way. If we all know that uh, six years after a stapedectomy or seven years after a stapes surgery, you are bound to have an SN loss and nobody can deny this. Every one of us who is in the senior bracket who are beyond say 20, 25, 30 years into practice or seen these patients. So will you tell that patient that, okay, don't do the stapes, just go in for a hearing aid. So if you are able to give that patient without CPAP for that much time, without hearing aid for that much time, that is your improvement in surgery itself. That is your success of surgery. So after surgery, if a patient requires CPAP, that's going to be very specific, unique cases where you will have to tell the patient that, okay, if you get operated, the effect of your CPAP, the pressures of your CPAP will reduce. So it will be more easy for you to tolerate CPAP. So if you have a blocked nose and you're going to give him CPAP, he's not going to improve. So you have a case who's got a completely blocked nose He's got severe central apnea and you know he's not very comfortable on CPAP. And if you're going to tell him, Ki, okay, only take a CPAP, don't do surgery, it's not going to work for him. So you need to make sure that you counsel him and tell him, listen, I'm removing your obstruction. CPAP is for a different reason. Surgery is for a different reason. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Chatrajit, for your comments. Yes. Uh, go ahead, Shirsha. You, Shirsha, you can let me know the other things because I think somebody asked about indications of pediatric dice. That, there was one question in the beginning. So, pediatric uh, OSA is a totally different big ball game and topic. I'll just answer your question on pediatric dice very specifically. That if I see a child who's got a um, symptomatology which is very classical and the parents are talking about very heavy problems that the child faces but when clinically i examine the patient i find that there is no big tonsils not much of adenoid seen and my clinical findings are not correlating with my history or with my sleep study if i've done it on the small child then i will definitely do a pediatric dice number one congenital uh, uh, skeletal muscular disorders, congenital uh, situations where chondroplasias and uh, skeletal issues, the uh, craniofacial abnormalities, there I will definitely do a pediatric dice if I'm taking up that child for surgery. Because you have to understand that even in a craniofacial disabnormality, 
if you think that the skeletal is got to be only dealt with uh, the skeletal part, you are forgetting that the skeleton, the the bony box is so small. There's a lot of thick tissue inside. You can expand the bony box by maximum 10 or 15 percent. And if you want better result, you still have to clear that soft tissue inside the bony box. So in that case also, I will do a pediatric dice. Right. So I have done your work for you, Sri <laughs> So we open up the discussion to audience. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. And uh, uh, speak uh, interact with the speaker. So they get to unmute themselves and talk. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, Dr. Seema, excellent presentation as usual. Sir, thank you, sir. Thank you for joining. Uh, uh, probably I will just summarize in the end that as you said, and my question was CPAP versus surgery. One dictum, but I always follow, let surgery be earned by patient and it should not be imposed on the patient. Absolutely that, well that, said. That holds good for every type of surgery. As far as the OSA is concerned, investigations are important to know the baseline status. Even say snorers, if we do surgery, before doing snoring surgery, we should rule out any OSA. You said very correctly, clinical evaluation history, 50% of the cases will be missed. So a, some sort of sleep study is a must as a baseline. That is uh, my impression. Secondly, Absolutely. We must remove the static component. We must treat the static component blockage first, then going for the dynamic component. And CPAP is akin to hearing aid, but little more complicated than hearing aid. You see most of the conductive hearing loss patients like uh, STEPIs and all that, they do carry on with the hearing aid for a very quite long time. When they are told benefit of it, I always use a word, don't condemn a young guy to a hearing aid. Similarly, if they have a static component, where are and our evaluation says good results with the surgery, don't uh, put it on the CPAP because CPAP is not that easy like hearing aid to handle. So that is uh, what I would like to say. Absolutely. Sir. Actually, Thank sir, you. that is one of the reasons why if you see my few beginning slides for this particular talk, when I talk about rational and this is that, you know, the... Yeah younger generation or the people entering into this field need to start having their thought process while they're talking to the patient. Yeah. So if, if you don't start understanding that, okay, where is the obstruction? What level is it? How severe? Mm -hmm. Is this really OSA or not? Is this pure snoring? These are things that you need to pick up in your first consultation. Yes. And there is no substitute for a proper examination. That includes minimum uh, flexible endoscopy as well. So, in fact, that is a message which I will give out very loud and clear to everybody. If you want to get into this field, do not even think of starting without a flexible scope, whether you purchase it or whether you have access to it. It doesn't matter. But you cannot think of starting this particular field without access to a sleep lab and without access to a flexible scope. Now, I think those who are working in institution, if their department have it, you can borrow it from the chain. Yeah, whatever, sir. Like, yeah, that's why I said access. Can be, yeah, I, I yeah. tell you. Yes, have access. Uh, um, uh, the cystoscope borrowed from surgery department because those late 90s, we didn't have the face SS. So I took the cystoscope to examine and then I convinced the people that yes, this is the equipment I want, then we got it. So absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we are sir. Sri are you there? Uh, sir, uh, Sri Harsha has a problem, sir. I'm Dr. Bhargav. I'm his colleague. I am also yeah, managing. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead because I'm told there's a heavy thunderstorm there. I was actually wondering yeah. if we'll be able to connect also or not. 
exactly sir he has got uh, disconnected um can i can i can i go from the last question sir yeah yeah please uh, go ahead uh, why is uh, osa is not included in the mediclaim uh well osa have been fighting on that for the past two years i myself at a personal level as uh, the founder president also had approached and it is now becoming uh, accepted slowly slowly because earlier it was classified as a lifestyle disorder now they are beginning to accept it but what is happening is in the past few years to all of you all who want to really get this cleared in mediclaim i have get been getting all my patients cleared under mediclaim the only thing you have to not do like you do in fes you cannot put the word allergy and sinusitis then mediclaim uh, you know uh, rubbish is it away same way you do not put sleep apnea or you do not put osa you need to say obstruction to the airway and any surgery that you put in you have to say uh, removal of obstruction to the airway yes we are sure you can join when you can right now we have taken over yeah I, yes yes actually no, about med claim dr siam for a thunderstorm is okay yes what you used to do uh i never used the word osa because the moment yes. they see osa they reject it so exactly. think, as you said very correctly say it is a chronic big tonsils or you can you put the exact diagnosis what surgery you are going to do so that way insurance guys they never object so that was my just one suggestion so it is going to come into uh, the system anyway so don't worry it's got nothing to do with mediclaim we'll be able to manage mediclaim over a period of time yeah you've disabled the chat is it okay That's no sir we haven't uh, disabled the chat sir okay uh, as of there are only two three questions sir yeah no i'm not able to answer them on the chat no problem go ahead okay sir sir uh, one uh, question was some patients may require cpap even after surgery how to convince patients pre yeah, operatively about this that this? was dr venus patel's question i've already answered that i've already answered sir, that uh, sir sir is okay with uh, with her answers then we can go ahead sir as of now only uh, those are the questions uh, present sir uh, no other questions great so if they want to unmute and talk they can talk otherwise we have a good sunday night dinner and we can call it quits <laughs> uh, dr seema uh, can you hear me yes yeah, i do, we are able to not yeah. hi, so, so please yeah hi, my name is dr alex matthews i'm calling in from singapore yeah it's a little late over here brilliant yes, talk alex. thank you so much for your for your for your brilliant explanation uh just a quick word um you mentioned in your talk that you ahi is not of much concern irrespective of high, how high it is i just wanted to ask you a couple of things number one you said you do a sleep study now after you have done a procedure do you um schedule a post operative sleep study maybe about 6 months or so after the procedure second thing is when you counsel a patient for a procedure can somebody unmute alex i think somewhere everybody got muted including me yeah alex go ahead please yeah so yeah so my question is basically you said that the ahi is not of uh, yeah i got the first part the second part so the thing is i want to know do you do a uh, a sleep study at the end of tackling all your multi levels because how do you exactly tell the patient even though like you said as a as a philosophy or a principle you're not concerned about the hi but how do you tell him that he has benefited from the surgery you know and both of y'all are in mutual agreement is it based on number one ahi or is it just based on his symptoms or is there anything else okay uh alex i am so grateful for you to be here at this time of singapore it's very late for you i realize that so thank you for being here unfortunately i don't see your video and uh, it's uh, you know maybe i would love to see you and interact with you sometime 
Let me start it's answering a, your questions. Let me start answering your questions. You can, you should put on your video so that we know who's talking. I, I would love yeah, to meet. Let me you. see. Let me see. Let me see. It's I, a, I very, very, yeah, so it's a very interesting question that you pointed out. Let me start by saying, when I said so that AHI yeah. is not important, I said AHI is not important to me as an ENT surgeon when I decide surgery because. If I am able to identify, and I'm putting this in inverted commas, anatomically identifiable site of obstruction, which I know, and I'm choosing my words very carefully, which I know I can tackle very well, very safely, and remove the obstruction very, very confidently. When I am dealing with a patient like this, the AHI does not matter to me at all, right? Because the obstruction is there for me to see and I know I can remove it safely and give better results or at least if nothing, I will be able to decrease that AHI. So that's what we're talking about quality of life quotient improving, right? That's the first part to your answer. The second part of your question, how do you decide when we are going to do the sleep study post-op? So if we have done a multi-level surgery, and the patient. So this is where the last few slides of mine are not there in this presentation. It's in a different presentation. There is something which is a sleep goal criteria from your own colleague in Singapore, Kenny and Brian Rottenberg, who are good friends of mine internationally. They have come up with the sleep goal criteria and we as an international community of OSA surgeons are trying to say to the chest community that why is it that it is only AHI which is the end all and the be all of success, right? So okay. if, for example, I have an AHI of 100, which I've managed to bring down to 60, this by definition of share at all does not come as success. But this same way patient, I have improved his quality of life. I've reduced his snoring. I've reduced his CPAP pressures. I've reduced his daytime somnolence. I have improved his control of hypertension. I have improved his impotence. I have improved his control of diabetes. In effect, I have improved a lot of things for him, but I have not improved his AHI to your particular standard. Okay. Right? So that's why there is a complete change of thought process about calling surgery a success. So the surgical okay. success now over a period of time, once it is accepted internationally, will not be defined by AHI alone, okay? Because AHI okay. alone cannot define all the other good things that I've done for this patient. And that adding on to further to what you said, that if, as suppose, you know, I'm doing a surgery to the right. nasopharynx and okay. I've improved the airway of the patient, or let's say I've done a velopharyngeal surgery also and I've improved the airway, and we know by Bernoulli's phenomena that as the air passes down faster, you can possibly have the lateral pharyngeal wall collapsing. Collab Whereby, okay. what has happened is that your surgery is done well, you have su been successful in your surgery, but because of your surgery, now the collapse has become worse and the AHI has worsened. So okay. your pre-op AHI, which was better, is now worse because post-operatively your obstruction lower down has worsened. Okay. Now that again cannot tell me that my surgery failed. That's true. So AHI again is not, I'm not rubbishing it away. I'm saying it's a very good physiological index. But contrary to the previous decades of thinking that AHI was the criteria for success, it is no right. longer the criteria for success. You have to take a very, very complete holistic attitude of success. Okay. And the sleep so I, I criteria completely encompasses the AHI also. It has so many other criteria. It also has the AHI. That is why it's a wonderful way of doing it. Yes. I hope that answers your question, I, Alex. I, I, I totally agree with what you said. No, the, the, the reason I asked is because um, but with all the teaching and the discussions that go on, you know, we are often the, the topic comes up as to how would you, um, how would you, how would you say your surgery is successful? And, 
um, you know, as you mentioned, you know, does the AHI drop by 50%? And then I remember this surgeon who was a good friend and senior said, actually, in all reality, the AHI should drop, as in drop, as in to like, you know, it's like less than five. But everyone was like, you know, that, that doesn't happen. Oh, exactly. It doesn't yeah, it doesn't happen. That's, 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 that's like where, wishful where thinking. Where in Singapore are you, Alex? Sorry? Where in Singapore are you working, Alex? I, 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 I work in this hospital called Kutek Pat Hospital. It's a, it's a relatively newer restructured hospital. I, I had the privilege of working with uh, Dr. Paul Mock. You, you, you might have heard yeah. of him. He, yeah, they're all colleagues. Paul Mock, Song yeah. Chen, Kenny Pang, all yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm so I'm very glad you joined in. We must keep in touch. Oh, definitely. I mean, the the funny enough, I I I got interested in the whole 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 concept of OSA courtesy Dr. Paul Mark. I'm very grateful. He actually brought in all the physics and into it, and um and I realized there's so much more into it, uh, more to it than uh, anything else. Anyway, yeah. thank you so much. I I I basically wanted to know your thoughts, and I must say the the line that caught me was how you. How you don't let the AHI dictate uh, your success and failure, but there's a lot more to it, which I definitely agree. And and yeah, I, I think what you said also about um, not uh, about redefining success of a surgery um, beyond the AHI. I guess probably that's a good review article that you could say. You know, success of OSA surgery or multi-level OSA, OSA surgery beyond the AHI. So it's I guess going to happen. If it wasn't for COVID, we would have been halfway there, but it will happen. <laughs> Give us about a year or two and we will work towards changing the success criteria. Yeah, 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 definitely. Oh, hopefully you can make you can make it in for the for for, for next year's uh the, the course here. Let's hope so. We'll try. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Thank you for Thank joining you. Thank you for Thank joining. You. Sorry, sir, I had a internet issue. Yeah, welcome back, Sri Harsha. Yeah, crazy thunderstorms. Anybody else, please? Yes, sir, there are two more new questions, sir. Uh, I think, Harsha, you can take over. Uh, actually, I don't have a chat box. Sir. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So, our okay, next question box is... I've like... answered everybody. I think you just let everybody unmute and talk if they want to talk. Yeah, uh, okay, sir. There are two questions waiting from Dr. Sachinarayan and Dr. Sachin. Yeah, please. Yeah, so I think they have put up in the chat box. I'll just uh, recite Where them to you. Uh, the new oh, last two right, right, right. Now I see it. Now I see it. Yeah. With changing scenarios, what do you advise in OPD procedures such as parietal stiffening and a later surgical procedure? Okay, so Satyanarayan, uh, OPD procedures such as palatal stiffening has very, very limited benefits. Please understand that. Okay. So if you are able to explain this to your patient that you're doing a very, very simple minor procedure and he or she should not expect miraculous results out of a minor procedure and they are willing to come in for a later surgical procedure, then it's fine. Do not do a palatal stiffening as a inverted comma stand alone procedure for OSA because that will result in a failure. I'm repeating, do not do it as a stand-alone procedure. It is something that you want to do in case you want to do a, a major surgery at a later date. If your patient is not able to come in for surgery right now and he has understood, he or she has understood the fact that a very minimal palatal stiffening cannot miraculously change your OSA criteria. It cannot even change your AHI uh, to a greater extent. Nothing like that. Uh, okay. Um, last question is by Mr. Sachin. Uh, what is the latest treatment of OAC, sir? <laughs> That's what we have been discussing. <laughs> Sachin, wonderful question, Sachin. I, I would really wouldn't know the answer to that. Latest treatment is, I mean, there is, uh, what do you call latest? There is plenty of so much that is happening in that field. Even the Hypoglossal nerve stimulator is not latest. It is almost 12 years old. So what is actually happening latest in uh, in OSA, it's got nothing to do with the previous surgeries. It is about the thought process. That is why my lectures are now more towards understanding OSA. Because let me tell you, and I said this in the beginning also, 
any junior resident or any freshly passed out ms candidate can handle the pallet very well you can do whatever you want you can do an expansion is easy relocation is easy barb pharyngoplasty is easy any tom dick and harry can handle the pallet suturing it is what your mind needs to be trained to be using is what dictates your success or failure and how you are able to identify what to do in which patient that's what dictates treatment failures so there's nothing beyond the uh, the hypoglossal nerve stimulators but that's not coming to india so you know let me tell you a very funny incident so when i gave my first presentation of osa my very first presentation way back in 2007 okay uh, it was uh, with uh, dr mohan kameshwar and right there in front of me in the first row and my last slide at that time was future of osa and i had put up all these photographs of uh, the hypoglossal nerve stimulator and i had said 2007 august and i had said ki the future of osa there's a lot more to happen there is you know the hypoglossal nerve stimulators that are coming in and this will change the entire treatment of osa 2020 february 7th before the covid lockdown was my last presentation of osa in person and my presentation of osa today also the last time still remains that that we are hoping that the hypoglossal nerve stimulators will come to india they have not come 12 years down the line 13 years down the line 15 years down the line they have not come and it's very unlikely that you know there's a lot of logistics involved with that so sorry uh, alex i don't have anything where i can write that down could you just quickly okay fine i'll just message you something yeah go ahead yeah, sure. take take the rest of the questions i just need to send him something Oh, so that is that of the your message oh, just give me one second huh? actually to answer the question that uh, that our colleague asked earlier about uh, latest treatment to osa i mean as dr simab said the uh, the hypoglossal nerve stimulation which actually is um, I, i presume in stanford institute it's probably up and running but i mean anything from what you see on the on youtube there's this device called airing there's, there's a lot of uh, controversy regarding it apparently on kickstarter if you pay 100 sing dollars you can get 100 pieces it seems apparently it's a disposable cpap i don't know how far it is but you will see a very emotional video of an elderly man whose life changed for the better with it anyway having said that that is one but there again the principle is pretty much the same is opening the collapsed air then there are things like dr simab said the hypoglossal nerve stimulation there are even things that you have where you have these pillows which has got a sensor placed under the bed which every time you have an apneic episode the pillow gets inflated so it keeps you on a slightly incline which the the philosophy i mean sorry the principle is uh when you're totally supple there's a base in the pallet so when you raise when the pillow gets inflated it apparently gives you the effect of a wedge pillow but it is funny because a wedge pillow is like a huge cheese slice under your pillow wherein there is no uh, strain on the neck and on the on the hip you have a pillow inflate like that in the middle of the night either you must be really in a deep sleep or either that you know it's it's something really crazy so and And, and 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 i remember in the past as as dr seema i had mentioned earlier senior very senior colleagues dr paul mock i mean i was i was suddenly exposed to all these surgeries like hyoid suspension and genioglossus advancement and then down the line you know everyone started to say yeah but you see as you know you know the patient comes all these complications and then you realize you're you're none the wiser so are we overdoing as you said knife happy are we trigger happy are we not understanding the whole principles behind the whole thing or are we jumping the gun so i think that's why you said you know you should know um the levels of obstruction to touch yeah you should you yeah you should know what you're getting at and it's 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 a combination of a lot of things rather than just say okay i've got big tonsils i've got a big tongue i've got a floppy palate and just go because at the end if the guy is 120 kg and he's got no obstruction and we go in there and then we tell him oh i've got 75% success but then we realize yes but his bmi is like 
I don't think we would be doing justice to him or ourselves. So yeah. One uh, more question I see in the chat box. Uh, again, this question has come from Dr. Venus Patel. She is asking how to include palatal surgeries in mediclaim because we cannot put in tonsils and septoplasty. So again, the answer remains the same, Dr. Venus, that uh, you have to mention it as a very thick and bulky palate causing obstruction to the airway. And that's the way they get uh, themselves uh, uh, allowed otherwise it is rejected you cannot put it as an obstructive sleep apnea or any but every time you put it as an airway obstruction then this is applicable and then uh, mediclaim allows that in one of my schedule i put the my diagnosis as hypertrophied uvula and palate bulky palate so that way the insurance company they entertained this uh, claim yes. it was just lap, just before the lockdown Absolutely. So, yeah. And to answer Dr. Alex, I will just like to add one thing. A good surgeon should always know when not to operate, then to when to operate. So when not then to operate. So that's a very, very important thing, sir. But that I think you know a lot of this comes with time and with the uh, a little bit of years of practice because everybody otherwise calls you an ENT physician till the wisdom really yeah. starts hitting them. <laughs> so it takes time for this to be understanding which patient 